Naked Lunch. Not THE Naked Lunch, but Naked Lunch. When it was originally published in France by Olympia Press in 1959, it did have THE in the beginning, but that was a misprint. This book is crazy. This book uh, blew my mind for several reasons. You know, the first time I read it, I thought, uh, okay, what the hell is going on? And the second time I read it, I thought, okay, what the hell is going on? But the third time, the third time I read this book, I thought, what the hell is going on? Well, we'll explain it a little bit. Um, it was actually banned in the United States. So it was banned in Boston and LA. And people that tried to publish it in Europe, they were harassed for publishing it. And rightfully so. It's got some pretty intense stuff in there. Uh, stuff today that is still extremely taboo. Uh, the postmaster general, whenever they sent to the United States, he said, "No, I can't even I can't even transport this or carry it because uh, it's against obscenity laws." But in 1966, they changed the obscenity laws, and this book was allowed in. This was the last book that was uh, challenged under such laws in the United States, and it is the sole reason this book became famous in the first place. It was that no notoriety that got publishers to pick it up. Uh, the author is William S. Burroughs. William S. Burroughs, he's a uh, postmodernist. He is responsible for the cut-up technique. The cut-up technique is whenever you take, uh, you write a work of art, and then you cut it up, and then you rearrange it to create a new story. Other people who are famous for this include Kurt Cobain, Iggy Pop, David Bowie. You know that song, um, Moon Age Daydream was like, I'm an alligator. That's cut-up technique. That's where that was created from. You know, also you got Tom York and Bob Dylan. Everybody's using the cut-up technique. This guy's responsible for that. William S. Burroughs. He also used the, the playback method. So he would use both of these things to write his stuff, but then he would also use this for like black magic stuff. He went to this mocha bar in London where while he was there, he thought they served him some cheesecakes that poisoned him. So... He went there and he would record the whole day. He would just sit there and record the whole day. And then he would come back the next day and play that tape so that he thought it would throw that uh, mocha bar out of space and time. It's no longer in sync with everything. Well, two months later, that mocha bar closed. And it was a popular mocha bar. He also did this to the Church of Scientology. He got them to move two, two blocks down the street. So that's kind of weird. But... Uh, William S. Burroughs. He was born February 5th, 1914 in St. Louis, Missouri to a wealthy family. And eventually, he and his family moved down to Palm City, Florida, where he started riding. Uh, he was wealthy, so he got to go to medical school, graduate school for anthropology, and Harvard. He even tried to join the military, but the military said, man, this guy is not mentally fit and we're not sure if we want him uh, serving for us. So they put him in limbo in which he started getting into drugs and he wrote his first book, Junkie. And that was a super popular book too. But eventually he moved to New York and he hangs out with the likes of Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac. And like Jack Kerouac is like the poetic one. Then you got Allen Ginsberg who's like, punch you in the face. And then you've got William S. Burroughs who's kind of just like cut and dry and just romantically insane. But he starts getting into uh, the LGBTQ culture and drug scene. And uh, there's even an instance where he severs his finger to impress another man that he was infatuated with. This is detailed in his story, The Finger. Uh, he failed to report a murder. Him and Jack Kerouac did not report a murder of another famous beatnik of the time, Lucian Carr. And he helped to get rid of some evidence. And luckily, he got out on bail. But um, Jack Kerouac was not so lucky. Neither was Lucian Carr. But so he meets this other woman called uh, Miss Vollmer, Joan Vollmer. And they, get, they hit it off romantically. But then they're also doing drugs. And they write a bad script for narcotics. And they got to flee to Mexico to outlive the statute of limitations. And Joan Vollmer was married to Jack Kerouac. But she left him. And now she's married at this time to uh, William S. Burroughs. Well, guess how she dies? A drunken game of William Tell. William Burroughs shot her in the face and killed her. Yeah, that happened. And then his brother paid off, uh, you know, paid off, you know, paid the lawyers, paid the judges, and played the policemen. So at this time, he's just traveling around South America. He's writing this book called Queer. 
And then he's writing another one called the Yage Letters because he's trying to find this drug called Yage that supposedly like helps you be telepathic, you know? And um, I'm not sure. I haven't read those. I don't know if he actually found the drug or what. But uh, then he moves to Tangier where he writes this book, um, The Naked Lunch. Later on, he'll move to uh, Lawrence, Kansas, and he'll die at the age of 83. The guy used drugs his whole life, you know, in what was it, 1997, he had a heart attack. And he was using heroin still. Um, the funny thing is, uh, the last time he was seen publicly was in a YouTube music video for The Last Night on Earth. And uh, this is also interesting. Did you know the band Steely Dan is named after a dildo from this book? Yeah, I said a dildo. This, And that is nothing compared to the things that happen in this book. Uh, this book, Naked Lunch. What does, what's that title about? Jack Kerouac said, the title means exactly what the words say. Naked lunch, a frozen moment in time when everyone sees what is on the end of their fork. So it's kind of like, what, what really is going on here? He thinks he can see this underlying thing. And like I said, I didn't understand this book. I really had to sit down and examine what was going on because it does, it jumps all over the place. And it is super confusing, but I'm going to give an attempt on how to describe what is going on in this book. Lee, the agent, main character, he is, uh, he drops some drug paraphernalia and he thinks these two police officers are chasing him. So he jumps on a subway, he goes to Texas, he goes to Mexico, and all of a sudden, uh, through some rambling about drug addiction and suffering, we switch through time and space to this imaginary world called the Interzone. And we meet Dr. Benway. Boy, I never want to meet Dr. Benway. He is a psychopath. And the things he talks about, I am not even sure I want to repeat here. But uh, he is played in a movie by Roy Snyder. Yeah, that's the guy from Jaws, the shark killer. He plays Dr. Benway. Um, but Dr. Benway shows him this reconditioning center that's like a uh, huge place where they mess with these humans and they're like zombie-like creatures and... When we're learning about all this, all of a sudden we jump to a place called Freeland where we uh, learn about Islam Inc. And there's an agent named AJ and AJ like kills people and does all this crazy stuff and pulls these funny pranks that seem really sick. Um, but then we jump again in space and time out of nowhere to uh, the black market or the, the marketplace where they're selling black meat, which is like crushed up bugs. But I think it's also like heroin because people are shooting it up and doing weird things with it. But we also meet these creatures there called the Mugwups. And the mugwumps are um, beak reptile creatures with no liver and a long black tongue. And they do some creepy shit to people, like sexual things. And then all of a sudden, then we jump back to um, the inner zone and we're with Dr. Benway again. And he's still doing creepy things to people. Uh, not a good doctor. And then we're in an orgy. And this orgy just seems to go on forever. Like, it's almost tiresome. And you're like, okay, this is shocking. Please end. Oh, we're still going. And like a hundred pages later, we're still in, we're still in the same orgy. And then AJ comes out of nowhere and he starts chopping people's heads off. And he's like dressed as a pirate for some reason. And there's, there's children getting raped in this orgy. And yeah, you can see why they banned this book. Uh, then we go back to the marketplace. Then we go to Anexia, which is like a totalitarian government. And we learn all about these different political parties. And then all of a sudden we're back into reality. And, you know, Lee is uh, confronted by these two people that were chasing him in the beginning of the book and he kills, kills both of them. And then he calls the narcotic squad and he says, you know, I just, I, I killed these people or something, something, something. And they say, those two police officers never existed. And he's really confused. And then he starts rambling. And then the book just kind of ends. And yeah, that's really how this book goes. The last line in the book is, No glot, clum fly day. Which is supposedly Chinese for, No got heroin, come back Friday. Last line in the book. It's a famous last line in a book. So that's what's going on in this book, whatever that is. And in 1960s, they tried to make a movie with Mick Jagger. And uh, Mick Jagger had a fallout with the guy who was producing it and it didn't happen. So then they were thinking about getting Dennis Hopper. And you can see um, Dennis Hopper do some excerpts from this on YouTube if you wanted to. But next we get um, a film that was on Netflix for a while, 1991, with David uh, Cronenberg, the guy who did Videodrome and The Fly in 1988. 
And he kind of takes a movie, the exter- or a book called The Exterminator, which is another story by William H. or William S. Burroughs, and he combines it with this and kind of creates this whole thing that is almost like William S. Burroughs' life, but it's super confusing, just like the book. So, what do I think about this book? I say don't seek this out. I say do not go find this book unless you want to be disturbed and you want to challenge every ideal that you've ever held and... It's not a regular book. There's nothing pleasant about this. It can be addictive at times. And um, literally, you can just open the book up and start at any point. This cut-up technique allows you to just open the book up, and there's your story. But try to read it from front to back. I'm not sure you really know what was going on. Uh, It did. Funny thing about this book is it did predict, I like very descriptively predict AIDS, LSD and Timothy Leary, the crack epidemic, liposuction, and like radical Islamist and auto, autoerotic asphyxiation. Like it describes this stuff in detail long before it ever happened. Um, this book is sick. This book is disgusting. This book is tiresome at times. But what saves it is this underlying humor. It's kind of like funny. It's almost, um, it's almost like a humorous cynicism. And it's got this intelligent scientific vibe to it. It's like if the homeless guy on the street that comes up and grabs you and is just crazy rambling had like uh, a science degree, that might be what this book is like. Uh, It's like Gonzo on steroids. It is um, like diving into the mind of a paranoid schizophrenic. And for that reason, I'm not sure this book makes a lot of sense. Uh, Yeah. Naked lunch.